Post-processing is what you do with an image after it is captured. I feel it's very important that you understand how to transfer, store, manipulate, and back up images. If you'd like to learn more, stay tuned while I conduct a deeper dive. As I do with most of my other videos, I'm going to start off by level setting. To begin with, I have a list of notes in front of me to help keep me on track, and I'm also making an assumption here that you are relatively new to DSLRs or you're relatively new to the concept of post-processing. Right here I'm holding a Nikon D3400, which is a good entry-level camera, but keeping in mind that it doesn't really matter what camera you're using. Post-processing applies to all cameras. I could be using the Nikon D500, the Canon 5D Mark IV, the Sony A6000. It really doesn't matter. The other thing is this. I'm going to go over the way that I post process. Now the way that I post process isn't necessarily the right perfect way. It's just my way. There's a lot of different ways to make it happen. It's kind of like saying, do you like Coke or Pepsi or Mountain Dew or Mellow Yellow or 7-Up or Dr. Pib or whatever else there is out there. There's a lot of different flavors and there's a lot of different ways that software packages can help you with the post process. So just keep that in mind. Now with that said, let's talk just for a minute about the game plan. I'm going to start off by discussing post processing in just a little more detail and then I'm going to get into a demo. And my demo is going to involve me taking an image straight from the camera and I'm going to go from A to Z. We're going to pull it out of the camera, get it into the computer, I'm going to show you how uh, Adobe Lightroom can help us out with that, how to store it, how to manipulate it, how to back it up, all that good stuff. So with all that said, let's go ahead and jump right in. What is post-processing? As I mentioned earlier, post-processing is what you do with an image after it is captured. So you're out shooting around and you're taking lots of shots. Click, 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 click. And all the images end up on your SD card, which is what we have right here. So. When you have the images on the card and you're done taking pictures for the day, that is when post-processing starts. Now, there are four key concepts to understand with post-processing. One, transferring of images. So, we need to transfer the images from the card to the computer or whatever machine that we have that we're going to use. And in this case, um, there are different ways to make that happen. Now, I have a card reader, and as I step through my demo, um, I do have access to Mac machines, but I'm going to demo on a Windows machine, and I have a card reader built into my machine. Now, I understand not everyone's got that, so um, they do make separate card readers. The other thing about a camera like this one right here, again, this is the Nikon D3400, but on the side of it, you have ports. And right here is an HDMI port. You won't be using that one, but the port right above it uh, you can use a cable and connect this to your USB port on your computer and when you do that you will turn on your camera again with this Nikon and your camera will act as a card reader at that point you can transfer the images off now this uh, when it comes into transferring you can transfer manually again in Windows I can use something like Windows Explorer and copy those images over or I can let the software package do it like Adobe Lightroom. Now, um, as I step through the demo, I'll show you how that's done. But this does transition into our file storage, which is our second important concept to understand, and that is the storage of files. So you want to store these files in a way that's going to be easy for you to reference. Now, in my case, and this is, again, just how I do it, but right off of my root drive, I created a folder called Pictures. And inside that folder, I have another folder called family if I'm doing family shots or if I'm doing work for clients I have a client folder now for family shots if I'm out taking pictures of my kids and family and whatever events I'm doing um, inside my family folder I have a bunch of folders and each folder has its own date and it's the date the image was captured now for me it makes it very very quick and easy for me to reference those pictures that I took on any given date now, as we step into the demo, I'll show you how, how I have that set up and how it looks and works and all that good stuff. So, the third concept to understand, and this is important, is manipulation. So, manipulation 
is this. If you take images in RAW like I do, um, I bring those in because I need to process those. Now if you take images in JPEG, you may or may not want to process. And when you get to the point of manipulation, you can manipulate as little or as much as you like. And this is really where your creativity comes into play. So manipulation is the third concept to understand. And the fourth one to understand is backup. Okay, so backup is really, really important. Now I spend a lot of time in technology and information security, and I could speak at nauseam about uh, the different viruses out there and ransomware, but ransomware has attacked um, a lot of image type files, and if it does this, then it can encrypt it, they hold the key, and chances are you'll never get them back. You don't want that happening to you. So what you want to do is grab yourself an external hard drive like this right here. And matter of fact, you may want to get two of them. The reason for this is maybe once a month or so, back up all of your images to an external drive. Now, if you have two of them, you want to take one of them and give it to a friend or a family member so it's off-site. That way, if something happens to your location, you're okay. You still have a backup to your backup, and that's always good. Keeping in mind that these images are your memories, so you don't want to lose them. You want to safeguard them. So with all that said, again, it's the four concepts, right? You have the transfer, the storage, the manipulation, and the backup. Now, with that said, let's go ahead and jump right into our demo. As we start with this demo, I am outside on a nice, bright, sunny day. And I'm going to take a photo or two of this bird feeder. Now, it's nothing special. And keeping in mind, this demo is not about composition or about a certain type of photography. This is really just a matter of showing you the post process. Now, I wanted two different images. I want one where our ISO is going to be low. And in this case, it's going to be 100. I'm going to go into aperture priority, and I'm going to open it wide up. Now, I'm doing this so I can get a little bit of background blur here. And then the second image is going to be inside where it's relatively dark and I'm going to intentionally shoot for a higher ISO where we have some noise in the image. The reason I want to do this is when we get into the manipulation phase of post-processing, I'm going to show you just how we can remove some of that noise from the image. So with all that said, let's go ahead and snap some photos. I'm inside now in a relatively low light situation. I have an overhead light on. And in front of me is a bouquet of dum-dums. Now, I used these uh, suckers in my last video and they're filled full of color. So I'm measuring an ISO of around 6400, which should introduce some good noise into this image. I'm gonna go ahead and just snap a few pictures and then we'll move right into the post-processing. What I've done is I took the SD card out of the camera and placed it in my card reader. And as I did that, again, this is a Windows 10 machine, it automatically detected the card and mapped the D drive to it. Now I went ahead and drilled into the directory structure, and what we see on the screen right now, uh, these are the files that are on the card. Now I'm aware that not everyone has a card reader, and as I mentioned before, you can actually use the camera as a card reader for the Nikon D3400 and other cameras like it. You can connect a cable to the camera and the other end to the USB port on your computer, and it should automatically detect it. Now, one thing I want you to note about this is that these last two files right here, they end in .nef. Now when I went through this exercise, I intentionally took some of these images in JPEG and I took a couple in NEF, which is also known as RAW. Now, the reason it ends in .NEF is that that is Nikon's version of RAW. And keeping in mind that other manufacturers, they have proprietary RAW versions, so their extensions may differ. For example, in Canon, it ends in .CR2. So it's just something to note as we move forward. Now, the next thing I'm going to show you is what my directory structure looks like. So let's go ahead and jump into that. So this is my directory structure. You'll see this is my hard drive, C right here, and right off the C drive, I have a folder called underscore pictures. Now, I like to put the underscore in there just because it takes that folder and bumps it right to the top. When I'm looking in Windows Explorer and I sort by the folder name, it's just right at the top, makes it easy for me to find. Inside that folder, I have other folders. So I have a folder for projects and clients, and in this case, I have a folder for family. Now, everything inside my family folder is images that are related to my family for the most part. But inside the family folder, you'll see a bunch of other folders. You'll see them all right here. Now these folders are all named by dates, and these are the dates that images were captured. So 
you take a look. I have 2004, 2005, 2006, 7, 8, and so on. Now, I do it this way because I find it very easy to reference various images. So, for example, if I'm looking for images from June of 2005, I just go back to it and it's quick for me to find anything that took place in that month anyway. So it's just one way of doing it. It's not the absolute right way. Again, it's just how I've been doing it for years. It's worked for me and if it works for you, that's great. You know, stay with it. So with this said, what I'm going to do is we're going to talk, uh, we're going to jump into and talk about Adobe Lightroom. Now keeping in mind that this video is not meant to do a deep dive on Lightroom. I'm just going to do a quick flyover and I'm going to show you how I use it to post process my images. So let's go ahead and step into that. So here is Lightroom. Now keeping in mind that I use a relatively old version of Lightroom. This is version 5.7 I believe. So um, if this is your first time seeing it, you might be a little confused by it, and I may do some additional videos just on Lightroom and the techniques that I use to really try to add some polish to images. So um, don't be too confused by what you see here, and keeping in mind that there are many other uh, software packages out there to kind of do similar functions. Again, this is the de facto that most photographers use, so let's just go ahead and kind of step right in. The way I want you to look at this is kind of like a clock. Okay, so we're going to move in a clockwise fashion. And it's just kind of a good workflow that, that um, I've used in the past and it seems to work out well for me. So if we start in the 7 o'clock position down here in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see this import button and export button. And as we move up, this is the directory structure, okay, that this is the location of where the images will be saved or stored. And this should look familiar because these are all the dates and I'm inside my family folder. And so as we move up and around, you'll come over here to the upper right hand corner and we'll see library, develop, map, book, slideshow, print, web. Um, now the two I mainly focus on are the library and develop. And um, I'll touch on that in just a little bit as we move forward. So as we come down, you have the histogram, quick develop, and some of this other good stuff here about metadata uh, and some other stuff. So. I don't really want to get into all those details right now. We're going to focus on import. So I'm going to come back over here to our bottom left hand corner. I'm going to hit the import button. And what Lightroom is doing is it is automatically reading the files that are on the card. So I haven't manually copied anything over yet. Okay, so all those images are still on the card. It reads them and it says here they are. Now you'll notice something interesting, right? Four of these images, these are the JPEGs, it rendered a thumbnail for. So it gives us a quick look saying these are the images you took and the check mark says these are the ones you want to import. Okay, so these are our two raw files right here, but there is no preview available for them. Now something to understand is this, that when a manufacturer releases a camera that's relatively new, software packages such as Adobe Lightroom will always be a step behind. And what I mean by this is that the raw files are proprietary to the manufacturer. So the software manufacturer, the software developers, they must develop a software profile for that new camera that comes out so that they can read those raw files. And in this case, we have that Nikon D3400, which is relatively new, but I also know that I am using an older version of Lightroom. So um, we're going to have some problems when we go to import it. Now I know some of the subscribers that I've had and some of the comments I've received have asked about this specific thing. So let's go ahead and step into this. Now again, in that clockwise fashion, we're going to start here on the left and as we come up, if we want to import files from the hard drive, we can do that. Now this is already saying, hey, I'm, I'm grabbing it from the card reader. That's fine. I don't care to touch that. Um, and we're going to move up and around, and here are some options. You can copy as a DNG, copy the file, move or add. Now you might be asking, well, what is copy as DNG? Copy as DNG is a nice feature for raw files because DNG stands for digital negative. And if you think about it like this, it's like a generic negative. Now Adobe looked at this span of all these manufacturers and said they all have these proprietary formats. What if we bring them all together into one unified negative format? That's really the concept behind DNG. So it has the ability to copy that proprietary format to a more generic negative format 
which is called DNG. So I always like to select this option right here when I'm shooting with RAW. But in this case, I do not see a preview, which it's like a tickler. It tells me that Lightroom, that my version, does not know how to read the Nikon D3400 RAW files. And I'm gonna show you what happens. And again, this is what some of the subscribers have experienced. So keeping with the clock, we're gonna to move to the right. And as we come down, destination's kind of the big one. Now, I haven't touched anything here. And because I've used it before, this is already set up and it'll save my last settings. So I like to import by the date the image was captured. And you can see right here, it's looking like it is storing to my hard drive under pictures, under family. And again, here are all the folders. So I don't really need to touch anything here. I'm just gonna come down and hit import. So here we go. Now this is meant to copy. I'm not copying as DNG, I'm just bringing it over. Now you'll notice on the screen, we have a couple of problems right here. And it's telling us these .NAF files, it doesn't know what to do with them, doesn't know how to handle it. Why? It's because of that profile. So I'm gonna go ahead and click OK. Now, likewise, you can go ahead and hit uh, check for updates. But I'm just gonna click OK here. Now, as I do this, what happened was that Lightroom brought in the JPEGs, no problems at all. You'll see the JPEGs right here. So what do we do to try and bring in those raw files. Well, Adobe created what's called the DNG converter. It's free, it's lightweight, you can grab it, you can download it. I may post a link uh, below and in, in the description of this video, but you can also go to Google and just type in Adobe DNG converter download and you'll get it. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Here is our converter. Okay, so this is what it looks like and when you pull it up, it's pretty straightforward. It's basically asking you, where is the raw file that you want to convert to DNG? So right here, and D is, is I'm gonna go ahead and select folder, but D is the mapped drive that my media card is sitting on, okay? So here's our folder, DCMI, and 100, D3400 is the name of our folder where our images are at. I'm gonna go ahead and hit select. And then it's basically saying, where do you want to save these converted images? I'm going to leave them in the same location. It's just going to go ahead and write that image back, but I can write it to anywhere. I can put it on my hard drive. I can do whatever I want. So keeping in mind what this software is doing is it's going to take that, that uh, Nikon negative uh, or that Nikon raw image, and it's going to convert it to a, to a .dng. And that's basically all you have to do. It's going to keep the same document name. It's just going to end up in .dng format. I'm going to go ahead and hit convert. So this is converting right now. You can see the status saying it's processing, it's waiting, this is processing, this one's converted. And so there, we're done, right? Those two have already converted. I'm gonna hit okay. I'm gonna go ahead and exit out of this because we're done with it. I'm gonna come back over here and hit import. And when I do this, it's going back to our card. And now what do we see? See this right here? DNG, DNG. So it took these two images it didn't know what to do with, converted them to DNG outside of Lightroom. Now Lightroom can read them. Now I don't need to go ahead and bring all these in again. I'm just gonna uncheck these. Okay, so now I'm left with just the two G and DNG files. Now they're already DNG. I don't need to copy as DNG. I'm just gonna go ahead and copy the DNGs back in. So I don't need to touch anything because it remembered everything. You can see where it's gonna store it. I'm gonna go ahead and hit import. And it went ahead and imported those two files, which we see right here. Okay, so I'm gonna come down here and it is 1230. I'm gonna go ahead and click on this. And you will see that these are the, uh, the six images that we have. We have the two DNGs, we have the two JPEGs, actually the four JPEGs, the two outside, the two inside, and we're ready. At this point, we're ready to manipulate these images however we want. So let's go ahead and step into this and take a look at these images. All I'm gonna do at this point is just double click on the first image. And now we're in the manipulation portion of our post-processing. So it gives me a chance to look at these images and see just how well they turned out. Keeping in mind, I'm still in the library up in here. I like to jump over into develop mode, which I'm gonna do right now. And what this does is it, 
it unleashes all the tools that are in Lightroom for us to manipulate this image and all of the tools are over here. Now we also have presets if you want to use them over here, over here on this side. Uh, but for me, I kind of like to stay on the right hand side and focus in on these tools. Okay, so this is the first image we took, and you can see right up it right up here in the upper left hand corner, it provides us some additional data. It tells us one eight hundredth of a second and an f-stop of 3.5, ISO at 100, and we we're at 18 millimeters. Now when you look at this, you say image is okay. Uh, F-stop 3.5, you can see a little bit of blur back here. That looks good. I'm going to go ahead and use my arrow keys, and I'm just going to arrow to the right so I can get to the next image. This is the next image up. You can see it's a close-up right here. Now our F-stop was at 4, ISO 100, 1 500ths of a second. And keeping in mind, it was sunny outside, so our ISO is dialed all the way down. And my suspicion here is that we're at 24 millimeters. We're probably wide open. Um, on that lens, I'm guessing. That's how we're getting the four. I don't know if we're wide open or not, but we're probably close to it. So let's go to the next image. This is the lollipop, so we're back inside with the JPEGs. Now look at our ISO at 6400, f-stop 4.8, 180th of a second. We're gonna take a look at the other one. So we're at f-stop of 50, still 6400. And we're gonna take a look at the uh, raw files right now. So this is our DNG right here, 6400 4.8, Again, we took two of these, so here's our other DNG. Now, I prefer to work with the raw files because, again, nothing's been thrown out. So that's what I really like, and this is where we're at. And, you know, if we try to compare these two, I mean, you, I don't know. You can kind of see the camera, when it went to create the JPEG, just look at the colors here. So it's going to try to render the colors and render everything for us and compress that image down. So this is JPEG. That's raw. JPEG, raw. Okay, so what I'm going to do right now is, again, I don't really want this to be necessarily about how we get into extreme detail on Lightroom, but I'm just going to do kind of a quick basic edit of noise reduction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in, and we're going to take a quick look at some of the noise. You see this? So that is noise. Okay, let's look at that again. So you can see this noise looks kind of pixelated in here. So what do we do to try and remove this noise? Now at a distance, the noise doesn't look bad. You're looking at this saying, well, that looks okay. But noise reduction in uh, Lightroom is done right down here under details. And when we come in here, you'll see this option for noise reduction. Now there's many other things that we can do to this image. And again, I may save this for another video, but I specifically want to focus in on noise reduction. So I'm going to zoom in here. We're going to take a look at this. And I'm going to raise my luminance right here. And we're just going to bring this up a little bit. I'm up to 40. You see what that did? How it kind of blended that together? Take it up a little bit more. You want to be careful with this because if you overdo it, it can look almost plasticky, okay? Where it uh, doesn't look quite real. Now, when I do things like this, I like to raise my sharpening just a little bit. And let's pull this up just a tad. And I'm going to pull back a little bit. I'm going to zoom out. And what I'm going to show you is masking. I'm going to hold down the Alt key. When I hold this down and I grab hold of the masking slider and I go to pull this, right? What this is telling me is anything in white is going to take advantage of the sharpening. Now, I don't want to sharpen everything on here. I really just kind of want to sharpen the edges. So I'm pulling it further to the right and a little bit more. And you can kind of see the white on the images here and what is going to take advantage of that sharpening. So I, I'm really looking at the wrappers here and let's go ahead and do that again and see if that looks good. Um, I kind of like that right about there. I'm going to increase our sharpening a little bit more. And I'm kind of liking the way that looks. I mean, from that sharp perspective, it looks great. Now, there are many benefits to shooting raw. And again, I'm going to, I'll do a deeper dive on another video, but one quick um, additional benefit is when we look at the white balance. When I click on this right here, I want you to notice something. Okay, so I'm in the basic tab and I'm as shot. You'll see it says white balance. I can do as shot, but I can also switch it to auto, daylight, cloudy, shade, tungsten, etc. Okay, and this will recapture the entire image under different white balance conditions. And I'm going to show you the difference right here. Okay, so if I go back to JPEG, I'm just going to back arrow again. And as we look at this right here, this is our JPEG image. But take a look as we look at our white balance. When I click on this down arrow, 
All I have is as shot, auto, and custom. That's it. So it is a big, big advantage if you're not quite dialed in on the white balance and you're in that situation but you're shooting raw, this is a big, big advantage right here. So I was inside, um, I don't know, I think I was, I don't know what kind of light we had here. It wasn't really daylight. You wanna see what it looks like if we go daylight? Ugh, looks bad. Cloudy, worse. Shade, even worse. Tungsten, looks a little better. Fluorescent, flash. You kind of get the point though. You can manipulate the white balance in much greater detail when you're dealing with the raw file. Okay, so, and again, there's many, many other things we can do this image. I'm gonna create some more videos because as I'm talking about it, I'm, I'm salivating over the opportunity to jump in here and really put my hands on this image, but we'll do that again later, okay? So, again, what we've done so far is we did our transfer, we talked about our file structure, and we talked about manipulation, okay? Now the last thing to consider is the backup. Okay, so with backup, um, I was talking about leveraging an external drive and maybe two external drives. And so it is important that when you come back over, uh, you go back to your directory structure. Now there are different programs you can use such as Syncback. There's a program called Syncback. It's a nice program for backups and it's free. They have a paid version as well, I believe. Um, but whatever version you want to use or whatever software you want to use to back up or you can manually do it if you want. But what's important is this. You go to your directory structure where all of your files are. In this case, I'm in the family directory or I can grab my pictures directory better yet. And what I do is I take that pictures directory and control C, go to my external drive that's attached to the machine, control V to paste. Now that's important. and. It's okay to overwrite everything on your backed up drive if you want. Um, you can also use programs to do what's called incremental backups. So it will try to detect those files that have changed or uh, some a, a file that's in the source but not the destination and copy that over. It makes for your backups to run a little quicker. But if you have a little time, just copy the whole thing. It's not a big deal. And I think that about sums it up. Post-processing is an important part of the overall journey. Keep in mind, you don't necessarily have to use Adobe Lightroom. There are many other packages out there such as Raw Therapy and Photoscape X, and I may create some additional videos on how to use some of those packages, and I may create some additional videos on doing much deeper dives within Adobe Lightroom and my techniques on how I bring photos to life. Now, I have been very appreciative of all the comments that I've received. I encourage you to do is to stay with the fearsome four, the P, S, A, and M modes, and practice, practice, practice. Now I know it can be frustrating at times, but eventually it will start to click, and when it does, you're gonna find yourself out and about somewhere without your camera, and you're gonna look at a certain situation, and you're gonna think, I know what I would do to take a certain picture and, and capture it in a certain way, and again, you'll do this without the camera, and when you get to that point, it's pretty cool, and that's when you'll know you'll hit a certain pinnacle. So you're going to get there, just stay with it. Now, if this video helped you out, be sure to give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't done so, subscribe to the channel. It's called Real World. More often than not, I post videos about photography and technology, but I also post them about things that happen every day, such as automobile maintenance and homeownership. So until the next video, take care of yourself and be safe.